fairly generalist, doesn't have strict habitat requirements, but they're worth a lot of money. And so both of the African gray parrots are, are endangered, and probably correctly so, okay? Um, so I think the criteria, the, the first table that I showed you, the criteria are probably reasonable. They just are often applied based on very fragmentary information and probably, I mean, they do have a category, data deficient. Yes. But that category should probably be used much more often. Okay? Okay. So I'm, I'm just showing you uh, graphics from the different um, publications on red list indices. Here, instead of develop, uh, div dividing them by uh, biogeographic realms, they, uh, they divide them by major biomes. So terrestrial, freshwater, marine, grassland, shrub shrubland, or forest. Okay, and you can see what marine is, is in the worst case recently and shrubland, grassland are doing better. But of course that's combining, you know, the, the savannas in Kenya with the prairies west of my house. Okay, so have I learned anything? You know, okay, grassland habitats worldwide are doing well and marine habitats are doing terribly. So we need to protect all the oceans on Earth and worry less about all the grasslands on Earth. Come on. Sorry I'm so negative about everything. <laughs> and then they've done this, they've decomposed it by families of birds. So game birds doing relatively well, parrots doing terribly, raptors declining. Okay, so now let's talk about red list indices. I'll be a little bit more critical. They depend crucially on the accuracy and consistency through time of threat assessments. As Franklin asked, they depend on the frequency of threat assessments. Perforce, they're restricted to relatively well-known taxonomic groups. Right, you're gonna see this for vertebrates, some groups of plants, one or two groups of insects, and not a lot more. It's just not gonna happen. Don't sit around and wait for the global threat assessment for carabid beetles. Ain't gonna happen, okay? And then, you know, there's another thing, which is that this process, this red list assessment process, is something that happens for the most part in North America and Europe, okay? And I, I just show you this picture and I'll let you guys take your own conclusions, okay? But this is something, and this is a kind of a repeat worry, is it healthy for conservation work or conservation information here or in South America or in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia, is it healthy for that to be depending on progress in Europe? And probably more important, not being informed integrally by national and local scientists, the people who are on the ground in the biodiversity rich regions. I'll just leave that for you to think about, but it's, a, it's an important thing to, to contemplate. Okay, let's go on to another one. Okay, again, remember we're talking about population status as an essential biodiversity variable. And what I just gave you was a uh, population status indicator that is implemented globally for several taxa. And so in that sense, 
it's been successful. Okay, I just gave you some reasons why, as a conservation indicator, maybe not. So let's go to another global implementation of a population status indicator. This is called the Living Planet Index. Living Planet Index tracks the state of global biodiversity by measuring population abundance of thousands of vertebrate species around the world. The latest index shows a decline of 60% in population sizes between 1970 and 2014. Population declines are particularly pronounced in the tropics, with South and Central America suffering the most dramatic decline, an 89% loss compared to 1970. Remember, 90% population decline triggers the endangered category. And this is an average across many species. Freshwater species numbers have also declined dramatically. But measuring biodiversity is complex, so this report also explores three other indicators, blah, 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 blah. Okay, all of these indicators paint the same picture, severe declines or changes. Okay, so let's now read between the lines. Relative frequency of major threats by taxonomic group. And so you see essentially for each, um, each bird species that is under some sort of threat uh, category, 3,789 uh, populations, where information has been available about what is causing the population decline, they've essentially summed those up here. And so you see, basically, terrestrial vertebrates, uh, the biggest threat is habitat degradation. Uh, for fishes, it's less habitat degradation and more exploitation. And then invasive species, disease, pollution, and climate change, lower. Okay, um, and so I, I didn't find a lot to take home from this graphic. Um, if you are studying a given population and you see that it is declining or increasing, how do you know that that is caused by climate change versus pollution? That would be an unbelievably detailed analysis to be able to make that causal attribution, okay? So I'm not sure I believe a lot of this. But here's, here's the state of your planet. Average abundance of 16,704 populations of 4,005 species monitored, get this, across the globe, okay? And they declined by 60%. The white line shows the index value and the shaded areas represent the statistical certainty. I don't know what that means. I assume it's a confidence interval of some sort. Um, but the range of the confidence interval is a 50% decline to a 67% decline. Now, they've gone a little farther. They've broken this down by region. And so what do we see? But the Nearctic region, which is essentially US, Canada, and the northern part of Mexico, the temperate zone part of Mexico, declined and is headed back up. Okay, we're doing a great job. The Neotropical realm, boom. What everybody's been waiting for, Afrotropics declined, but have been steady since 1990. So guys, you don't have to worry as much. <laughs> Indo-Pacific declining, Palearctic declining somewhat. Do you believe it? No. Why not? Hold on. 
too generous. I personally think it's too general. It's, it's not as detailed as I would want, want it to be. Where, where do people study vertebrate populations? We have a bunch of Rwandans here. In Rwanda, what vertebrate populations are under study right now? They're being studied in terms of their population. Obviously, mountain gorillas. Yeah. What else? Uh, also, some primates. Sure. Yeah, some primates are studied, some beds yep. are studied. Where? Here? No. Farmland? Actually, National all, parks? all those studies are focusing on protected areas. Exactly. Outside of protected areas, nothing is known. Exactly. It's the same around yeah, the world, basically. It's a common trend here in Iwana that when we talk about biodiversity conservation, most of the people, most of us, we immediately think about a protected area. Yes, exactly. Why we have a lot of biodiversity outside of protected areas. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and we, we don't study that biodiversity. Yes. Oh. Have we done many studies to show populations outside protected areas to also warrant the conservation language? No. That's the thing. Now, in some cases, I assume like mountain gorillas, there aren't populations outside of protected areas in this country at least, yeah. Yeah. right? I assume in the Congo there may be, but, um, but in other cases you may have a species that's qualified as endangered and you're studying the population in such and such national park and you don't know whether those are the last 50 individuals of the species and, the, and nothing outside or that there are lots of other populations in, outside. And what are the relative trends? You don't have that information. Okay? Now, coming back on, on this presentation, uh, I doubt about the, the hope that uh, this is correct. Because it is, for me, it is more broad. Uh -huh. It is more broad. We don't see specifically, if we, we are concerned with Africa, for example, where this data were collected, in which country were collected, where all, all countries have the same trends in terms mm -hmm. of declining, decreasing. I'm going to show you maps at least, <laughs> and you can download their database, mm -hmm. okay? But I'll, you'll see why I, that's not going to save us. <laughs> So there is a map of where these data are coming from. Okay, and right away what you see is lots of studies in Europe and lots of studies in North America. South America fairly sparse. Africa fairly sparse except for this swath. Asia largely empty except for India. Australia, largely empty except for the coasts. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we want more information. How many are in protected areas? Mm -hmm. How many are in not protected areas? Mm -hmm. Okay, for how many species do we have both? Yes. Right? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff to get into with this. In there, there are large biases and they they clearly relate to species richness, like Australian species richness is focused there, and that's where the studies are being done, and you can see species richness here is very low. Um, in the US, it, I, I mean, basically where I live is left out, but, um, <laughs> but other than that, it's, it's reflecting population and it's re reflecting uh, taxa of interest, you're right, Europe, at least Western Europe, seems to be covered completely. India does a lot of intensive wildlife uh, monitoring. And you can see East Africa, you know, probably very related to the savanna ecosystems. But yeah, these biases are maybe damning. What do we have from the Congo Basin? Nothing. Nearly nothing. Be generous. Nearly nothing. Amazon, just a few points along the, the river. So 
So do you really want to make continent-wide conclusions from highly, massively biased data? So there are all sorts of publications using these, um, these indicators. This one is broken down by um, Nearctic A, Afrotropical B, Grasslands, Birds and Mammals C. Uh, here's the global average. Again, I'm just showing you this stuff. I'm not advocating for it, okay? Um, more publications using species population time series to track trends in biodiversity. So look, using abundance trends of one species to track global trends in all biodiversity. See, I'm adding in words. Maybe I'm changing their meaning, but I think it's, it's essentially an over-interpretation and an overstatement of what they're doing. And then, of course, we see the good news. Modest recovery of biodiversity in a Western European country, the Living Planet Index for the Netherlands. And this sort of stuff, sorry, that, that photo isn't really good. It's, about, it's a photo of a meadowlark, which is a prairie bird, with its head blowing up. Um, just a couple weeks ago, there was a huge news blitz from Cornell University Nearly 30% of birds in the U.S. and Canada have vanished since 1970. And that's why the metal arc is vaporizing. So, it was really good publicity. Okay? And it's really, really effective to say 60% decline. And yet it's based on almost no information. Remember that, 90% in the Neotropical realm, and yet, look what we have from the Neotropical realm. Okay? So, reality check. Living Planet Index is highly biased spatially. It takes into account only the last four or five decades. It has tons more data in the north than in the south. It's a region-wide assessment. You, you saw one example from a country. But you can't get fine-scale resolution because in this case you're asking how dense are the population studies? You know, if you had, for some species of interest, if you had a population study every 100 kilometers across its range, then you could map at 100 kilometer resolution the population trends. And if you had that for 100 species, you could map the average population trends. But if you do that sort of study, you know that it's extremely time and effort intensive. And you're lucky to have two or three population studies for even the best known species. So essentially what I'm after is here we have two global scale implementations of population as a, you know, species populations as an essential biodiversity variable. And what we see is that each of them has its problems. Okay? Now we'll go in and look at the actual status of the data in a moment. But I do want to give you just a hint at an approach that could be able to downscale um, these ideas considerably to the point where you might be able to say, well, within my country we can see that this region is in good shape and this region is in bad shape, or that population declines are uniform across the country. So this is just some thinking that a colleague and I did a few years ago. Uh, the colleague is Jorge Soberon. The title, Monitoring Biodiversity Loss with Primary Species Occurrence Data. So essentially what we're saying is forget about these secondary products like uh, a conservation threat assessment. 
And forget about requiring super high quality data like a 10 year population uh, study. Let's just use the simplest form of primary data, a record of this species in this place at this time. What can we learn from that? And this is, this is maybe getting a little old, um, but the framework is there. We've got newer methods that are probably better, but I wanted to show you this. So first point is we have tons of primary biodiversity occurrence data. This is a graphic by year of the number of records originating in that year. Okay, so you know this point is saying that in 1840 there are approximately a thousand records that came from the year 1840. This is data from GBIF and it was about 10 years ago that we did this analysis. And so the really interesting thing is, is you see this on a semi-logarithmic scale, you see a nearly linear increase. And so that's equivalent to saying that every 42 years, we are producing tenfold more biodiversity data per year. Okay, excuse the vulgarity, but it's a shit ton of data. We have 1.3 billion records of these primary biodiversity records online right now. And for the two previous global assessments that I showed you, neither uses that information. So we set out to use that information. I don't have great illustrations, and I don't want to go into detail because this is kind of lateral to the topic, but what we do is we train ecological niche models and then transfer them over um, either forecasts or uh, examples of change. So it could be changing land use or it could be changing climate. But we take those niche models and we take what we trained for the early period and we transfer them to the later period and that gives us a hy hypothesis of how the range changes. And then we can go very fine scale. So we did this for Mexico. This is just to give you an example showing pine forest in the dotted lines and rainforest in the solid lines and we can very easily break it down by region because these are continuous raster maps across the whole country. So I just, I just bring this up to be able to show you that we do have the potential to work at finer scales if we go back to the primary data and use the primary data intelligently. Okay?